Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome to MDC Connects. Um, we're now in the third in a series of five weekly webinars um, that run every Tuesday um, at one, one o'clock. Um, so each year, um, Medicine's Discovery Catapult comes together um, and runs this short series of weekly webinars. And we're joined by experts from across the community that come together with us um, to inform and advise the community. In previous years, we've concentrated on the science in drug discovery, but this year we've done something a little bit different and we are providing an informative series outlining the journey from innovation to commercialization. We've got quite a stellar lineup of speakers this year. Um, we've had funders and venture capitalists, we've got CROs and science parks, we've got patent attorneys, and um, the pharmaceutical industry, all freely giving their expertise. Um, we started out in the first week, we set out the challenges. Um, and last week, we talked about securing funds. And this week, um, we're going to be using those funds and building the science. So talking about access to skills, capabilities and infrastructure. Then next week, we will move on to um, building your IP strategy to build business growth, and then finally, um, how to commercialize your innovation. So for today, we have three speakers. We've got Graham Wilkinson, who's head of virtual R&D at MDC, and Graham is going to talk about the breadth of skills that are required um, to run a drug discovery program. Then we've got Gareth Hampton, who's Head of Laboratory Services at Bruntwood SciTech here at Alderley Park with us. And Gareth's going to talk about what you need to know about accessing labs and infrastructure. And finally, we have Mike Piper and Angelo Pierze, um, both from BioAscent. So Mike, Chief Commercial Officer and Angelo, Associate Director. And they're going to describe how to access drug discovery expertise um, in the CRO sector. So at the end of each of our presentations, we will take questions from you. So if you can add these into the Q&A box on your screens, not into the chat box, I think the chat's disabled actually, but into the Q&A box and please add them at any time in the talk so that we're ready to take those questions at the end of each presentation. So over to you, Graham. I hope everyone's seeing this now. Um, great. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for inviting me to, uh, to take part in today's webinar. I'm delighted to have the opportunity and to join the other presenters um, today. Um, as Sarah said, we're talking today about um, building the science and covering some of the aspects that are critical to that. And I'm going to focus in the next 20 minutes or so on um, the kinds of skills and expertise which are typically re required to, uh, to develop um, a drug discovery project. Um, first of all, um, Sarah introduced me. Um, I, I've been with the Catapult for um, coming on for well, six and a half years now. Um, and I'm, uh, I, I lead our capability in virtual drug discovery, which hopefully has some relevance to the topic today. My background is in um, is, is from large pharma startup and self-funded um, startup as well. Um, and I've got uh, experience across a, a wide variety of, of different disease areas and therapeutic modalities. So, so hopefully be able to bring some, some relevance to today's talk. So, the skills needed to develop a successful drug discovery uh, project. So what are we talking about here? So it's not just accessing those skills externally through networks uh, external to your organization. It's also about developing them um, for yourselves as well. So I think it's, there's an important aspect here around accessing and developing those, those skills and expertise. I'm hopefully going to run through the types of skills that are needed, um, where they might be accessed from, and, and who may, might need those projects, uh, sorry, who might need those skills for their projects. And I'm really going to be focusing this from the perspective of 
um, smaller organizations, primarily small SMEs or startups who are coming to drug discovery, perhaps with you know, an understanding of what's um, needed, but relatively little exp experience in, in pulling together a project. And often those projects will be run in what we call a virtual setting. So you, you may potentially have no access to laboratories at all, but still be perfectly capable of running a, a, a drug discovery pr program via networks of, of, uh, of, of third party organizations. More often than not, um, startups and SMEs may have their own labs, but need to, to access the other skills, expertise and equipment, et cetera, that's required. So this, this slide is deliberately busy. Um, I mean, the, the point here is to try and ex exemplify the fact that drug discovery is both a complex, costly and resource intensive um, endeavor. We're all aware of this. And you know, we, we often come in with our own specific expertise. Um, my background personally is around pharmacology. So you know, in, in, in the context of a full drug discovery project, those, those skills and expertise may only be used within a certain part of the project. But clearly from, from this slide, you know, in order to move from the initial idea through validation, et cetera, all the way through to identifying a drug candidate takes a lot more uh, than just pharmacology skills to, to achieve that endpoint. And some of them are, are, uh, are, are mentioned here. This kind of, these kind of activities used to be, uh, and traditionally were, were all within the, the four walls of, of large pharma with only certain aspects of projects being outsourced. But now it's, it's you know, it's increasingly common even for, for large organizations to outsource or to work in partnership with external organizations to, uh, to, to, to access skills and experience that perhaps are, are not uh, ordinarily um, held within, within, uh, within the settings of companies. But clearly, as I've mentioned, you know, for a small company, it's vital that this, this, uh, these types of activities can be brought together at the right time uh, through relationships. Now, in the first uh, series of webinars, we heard quite extensively about some of the challenges that uh, SMEs and startups are facing. I just wanted to to uh, to re, you know re reprise those. So clearly, we're we're aware of 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 cost pressures, fewer resources, more dependency on 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 grants. Um, and private funding, it's, it's difficult to put together the, the financial runways for, for companies to exist. We're, we're aware of skill shortages, so that's you know, hiring sufficient skilled individuals uh, for companies to grow, and also that access on, on, on additional space. So even if a, a company has you know, its own laboratories, it's certainly probably not set up to do everything that's required for a full drug discovery project. And as we'll hear from later speakers, the access to those skills and infrastructure and laboratories are critical parts of the, of, uh, of, of uh, modern drug discovery uh, in that kind of virtual setting. We also heard in the first series of webinars uh, a, a bit more detail about where the, the pressure points are being felt in terms of accessing drug discovery skills. So it's you know it, it's being felt right across the drug discovery ecosystem from, from those small uh, companies through to uh, you know CROs and, and other established organisations. So it's it's not just the, the small seed and venture companies who are feeling the pinch, as it were. But access to those skills is is increasingly difficult, and therefore even larger and more established companies need to access uh, additional infrastructure. But put yourself back in the the um, the perspective of of somebody who's coming at drug discovery. Um, through perhaps you know spinning something out of a university, or adding a project into the portfolio of an SME, um, what's required often of, of the innovator is is to an understanding and an ability to run really everything within the project portfolio. So often we might come at a project with expertise in a particular target or disease area, but that's not sufficient. You know we need to clearly understand 
the, the, the molecules or the, or the ways we're going to intervene with the target. We need to understand the disease indication in, in, in depth and how that might be, um, might be intervened with. We need to understand the market very clearly. And by that, I don't just mean the commercial opportunities, but also the patient segments and where the opportunity is going to be placed in the clinic and the needs of the regulator in terms of how those, those clinical experiments and anything preclinically that would be assessed by a regulator need to be, need to be framed. This is, is about making the science investable. So I, I touched on funding, which has been dealt with in earlier presentations, but putting together a package which is robust, which meets the needs of investors, such as venture capital organizations or, or others, such as pharma partners, is absolutely critical in terms of taking that forward step and, and bringing projects into, in, into, into the clinic and onward into, into patient groups. But beyond that, there are other critical skills, which are what we might term soft skills. So, you know, I've, I've listed a few here. It's by no means comprehensive, but clearly, you know, clearly communication, teamwork, developing business acumen, et cetera. Are, are, are critical skills for drug discovery entrepreneurs and can be both learnt on the job, but also gained, I think, through the networks that one develops and cultivates and skills picked up through, through mentorship, coaching and other, other types of experience. So who needs these skills? Um, I, I think the, the skills are required right across uh, the types of organisations who are involved in drug discovery. I've focused on those smaller SMEs and startups and spin outs, but I'm, I'm, I've mentioned CROs, there are critical skill shortages. So maybe CROs need to think about how they're accessing and filling gaps. Um, universities and others wishing to um, capitalize on, on, on IP that's been, dis, that's been discovered and developed in a, in, in a university setting. The, the, the tech transfer offices, et cetera, will need access to, to this, these skills and know how similar um, opportunities and, and need for skills will be felt by venture capital organizations who are looking to fund these types of projects in the future. And the layers of, of, of this diagram kind of indicate the types of skills which might be required as, as one steps through a project. So early on, drug discovery and disease area expertise, then how to develop those fully executable plans and, and bring them in, into, into reality uh, with, a, with a fully worked up plan and, and the ability to, to manage the project, both bringing internal and external relationships to bear, developing relationships with CROs and, and other specialist service providers in order to deliver the, the data that um, formulates that, that investable plan. And, and develops the opportunity for the business to grow and scale. Now, at the catapult, we, we often use um, the AstraZeneca 5Rs, 5, yeah, 5Rs framework as a, as, as a model for, for pulling together a successful plan. And I use this um, um, slide now because I think it really helps us understand the types of um, expertise and skills we're needing all the way through the, the, the project, uh, the, the, you know, the, the project life cycle. So we often start off with a, with a target which, which needs to be understood in context with the disease, but that's not sufficient. You know, we need to understand whether we're able to uh, get a, a molecule into the tissue, whether that is able, you know, we're able to, to demonstrate engagement with the target, whether we're, we're able to um, to, to look at the, the pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics, etc. Safety is a clear, a clear issue when we're trying to bring something into the clinic because that relates to the patient setting and identifying the most, you know, the, the most responsive patients for, for, for testing clinically. And then clearly nothing is going to be successful if it's not meeting some form of uh, commercial opportunity uh, which can be visualized. And we need to understand that in the context of current unmet needs, um, in, in terms of what's required from the market, gaps that might exist, and the needs for, for, for bridging those gaps. So this, this I think, is a really strong uh, framework that we, that, that we can use, not just to build the scientific plans, 
but also for, for helping build the, the overall um, plan for, for project execution. Bearing that in mind, that needs to be then translated through lots of discussion, lots of talking to experts. And in this next slide, I hope what uh, we're, we're trying to do is, 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 is indicate how this might be brought, be brought together. And this slide is courtesy of my colleague, Sarah, who's, who's leading the, this webinar series. Um, and this is an approach we, we take at the Catwalk. And I just use this as, a, as an example of, of what, uh, what, what you might want to be considering in terms of pulling, pulling together the right understanding of your project in order to identify the skills which are needed and the expertise to move that forward. So first of all, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's conducting a, a, a root and branch analysis and review of the status of the project. So where is it? What data does it currently is that data fit for purpose? What gaps, et cetera, might there be? And therefore, from that, understanding um, what types of things we need to do in order to bridge those gaps and take it to the next milestone. That will allow us to understand the types of skills, focusing primarily here on, on, the, on drug discovery pre-candidate nomination, but the skills where we can bring together um, the expertise from chemistry, pharmacology, and, and other experts uh, into a virtual room or a real room to discuss what the project requires. Um, organizations like MDC and, and other experts can, can help in, in, frame those, in framing those questions, making appropriate challenges and, and, and building the project out of that, from which a, an outline recommendation can be, can be brought forward. And then ultimately, uh, worked up into a fully executable delivery plan, which can be, you know, worked on virtually or or um, by the organisation themselves uh, by by looking for a variety of delivery partners. So, what we try to do here is is is, is indicate the the breadth of different kinds of skills that are required, and 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 how they're brought together under the banner of a of a successful drug discovery pro project. But accessing accessing those skills is clearly a challenge and you know knowing where to start is not necessarily you know easy when you're when you're you know new to the game or, or starting out in a, in a new project and uh, you know there are, there are some examples here of, of, of opportunities to to engage with skills to engage with with knowledge such as membership organizations I mentioned a few of them here um, who who you know are, are critical members of, of the UK uh, landscape so uh, organizations like LRIG, OBN, BioNow, the British Pharmacological Society are great organizations to be involved with. Similarly, um, there are regional innovation clusters and service providers, um, organizations that we've been involved with, and, and the, the map here shows the distribution of, of a number of those throughout the, throughout the country. But these provide opportunities for testing hypotheses, for networking, professional development, upskilling oneself in, in drug discovery. And many um, um, of, of these innovation clusters and, and bioparks will run what are called drug discovery accelerators, where you could come together in, in cohorts um, of like-minded uh, uh, looking to, to, to increase your skills and to go through a, a, a professional journey in, in developing your project. So I would certainly recommend um, you know, being uh, involved with these types of organizations and and, uh, and and trying to get involved in in in, in meeting people and, and networking where, wherever possible. So just to summarise, I think I'm on, on time here. Um, what I hope I've, I've tried to do here is is um, indicate to start off with that drug discovery is a very complex um, you know, venture, but it is a team sport. Uh, part of the skill that's required by an entrepreneur in this space is knowing which skills you need and when and Often that's, that's developed through interacting with others who've, who've taken this journey. But clearly um, the, the entrepreneur, the, the, the person who's coming up with the idea is the expert in the science. They know what they want to achieve and you know, what they're trying to do then is build the team around them virtually in order to make that happen. Um, and hopefully we've, we've indicated here that in varying your experience, going out and networking and learn from experts is absolutely critical in order to bring together the, the right combination of skills and expertise to make, make a, a venture 
uh, successful. So I'd like to finish there. Thank you for the opportunity to give this brief overview of, of skills. And I think I may have a minute or two for questions, Sarah. Yes, thank you, Graham. Thanks very much for that. And also, interestingly, Graham, that you, you didn't just focus on the science, but there were some soft skills in there. And that was highlighted last week in the um, webinar where the venture capitalists were talking about the importance of the people in a team. Um, so it was nice to see that again. Anyway, um, looking at what questions we've got in, in the box at the minute. So from an academic, um, who's moving into translational research. Where do you think I should start and what do you think are the most important skills of those discussed that I should focus on? Great question. Um, where should one start? I mean, if, if I would make sure, for example, if it's an academic who's, who's working in a university, you know, perhaps talking to colleagues who may, may have taken this journey uh, to the tech transfer office, et cetera, um, you know, if, if you're um, in many of the major universities, you might have access to local science clusters, you know, for example, the universities in the northwest here may well have local access to the, 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 you know, the, the, the site that we're um, present at Alderley Park. Similarly, you know, in Glasgow in, in, in Edinburgh and places like that, the, the science parks which exist there, get out to those areas and perhaps you know, try to talk to those to those individuals and 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 build those those relationships. Um, yeah, I think I mentioned some of the the, the, the mentoring organisations and networking skills and networking organisations that could be useful to plug into. Um, I would also talk to CROs. You know, it's it's. Uh, I hope this is a, a shameless plug for our amazing CROs in the UK, but. There, as, as we'll hear from at least one today, they're an amazing source of, of, of knowledge and, and understanding. And I think many would be very happy to, you know, to, to just have those initial discussions about what, what could be done in a project. So that's, that's just a few ideas. Hopefully that's useful. Excellent. Thanks, Graham. So we'll move on to Gareth now. Um, so if you want to go ahead, Gareth, but Graham, just to point out, there's there's a question in another one unanswered in the Q&A. If you want to just go in and do that. Oh, thanks. thanks, Gareth. OK, thank you for uh, allowing me to come and speak here today. Um, you probably find during the um, content of this talk, it's something I'm quite passionate about and something um, I've probably learned from my mistakes and hopefully today I can give some of that um, uh, experience to try and help you avoid those mistakes. Um, so um, my name is Gavin Hampton and I am Head of Lab Services at Global SciTech. Uh, so my background was started off in, in large pharma within, within AstraZeneca like many people on Orly Park. And we had a very robust interview on how labs were run. And then moving into smaller organizations, found out actually the decisions you make in those early stages have consequences and you need to get those decisions correct. So today I'm going to talk about the, the importance of accessing the correct lab at the right time. And if indeed you actually need a lab, sometimes people are quick to decide that they want to get in a lab, they want to do some science, and that's not always the right move. So hopefully through the content in the slides I'm going to share today, we'll be able to navigate that journey from start a company through to larger organization and answer some of those questions along the way. Uh, some of my slides have got a lot of information on there, so I'm gonna to attempt to go through them fairly quickly and pull out the key talking points and the main takeaway messages. Um, the slides will be available afterwards, and if you need further information, there are links to some of the content that I refer to. So I'm going to start with the basics. What is a lab? What is a wet lab? Um, simply put, a lab is an environment designed to keep the users or the experiments safe. Um, so on the left side of the slide, you'll see some descriptions of containment and contamination. I'm not going to go into the details of what they are, uh, but those are the two factors you need to keep in mind when we're talking about what lab space is appropriate for the work that you're going to be performing. 
Uh, on the right hand side of the slide, there's some requirements that all our environments should deliver. And if they're not delivering that, then there's something going to be compromised along the way. Um, so the, the, the main distinguishing factor you've got to determine is do you want to contain hazards and keep your users safe? Or are you more concerned about contamination from external factors affecting the science or the experiments you're going to be performing? Um, so what should you be looking for in a typical wet lab? Um, so a typical wet lab, which you would expect to find in large pharma, universities, science parks, wherever that may be, are not all the same. So there are certain things these labs have to deliver to enable you to perform the science which you're going to need to do along your discovery journey. Um, so simple things like IP rated light fittings. So for, for lab areas, IP65 light fittings are recommended. This isn't generic across spaces, especially with a trend of office spaces being converted into labs. And what IP65 means is your light fittings and electrical fittings are dust and liquid proof. So you, while you're performing hazardous activities in the lab, you're not going to be risking issues with your lighting. Um, all labs have to have local exhaust and ventilation. So when we're talking about local exhaust and ventilation, this is where the safety cabinets and the fume cupboards come into play. Again, this is not a given. If you don't have the correct air handling units within the plants of those buildings, they can accommodate these cabinets. So it's something that you really need to be focusing on if you're looking at lab space. Something which is sort of, you will all like snigger when I say this, uh, trespa benching, benching which is impervious to chemicals is a must within a lab environment. Um, typically in universities and science parks, that is standard, but we're seeing a trend of labs being made in spaces they wouldn't normally be made, which is obviously great for the industry because it gives choice. You just got to be aware. Those are the questions you need to be asking. And something you possibly need to take into consideration is you're doing your science activity in a lab. Where is the right of where is the, the, the softer skills being performed? Can you see your lab? Does that have a health and safety impact? And then before I move on, um, when we talk about labs, we typically speak to wet labs. There are other types of labs. So the physicists in the, in the audience or computational chemists would also refer to their areas of work as labs. And the function that you need to be looking at these is the electrical power, the, the data, the connectivity, the infrastructure of the building. Can it handle the servers? Can it handle the things you're going to be doing with that? And they're very different to, to wet lab environments. Uh, my experience sits firmly within the wet lab environment. So the next few slides, I'm going to move on to specifically talking about wet labs. Obviously, dry labs do exist, and if there's any information you need on that, um, we do have colleagues who can advise on that. So again, another basic uh, slide for apologies to those in the audience who uh, already know this. Uh, the typical types of labs we would come across are uh, chemistry labs, biology labs. There are other labs, but in the main, they will fall into a mixture of those areas. And as long as we keep that contamination and containment um, idea at the front of our minds, you should be able to find the appropriate lab for you. So with any chemistry lab environment, you should be looking at the disease regulations to find out what sort of extraction, what sort of control you need to make that area safe. Um, biological labs become a lot more complicated because you've got a multitude of hazards uh, in those spaces. Uh, so we have got some slides around that a little bit further down. Um, so what I'm trying to do on this slide is to, to highlight there are different types of labs. As we go through the talk, I'm going to talk about it in a little bit more detail. But you don't necessarily need a 2,000, 3,000 square foot lab from day one. And there are lots of opportunities out there. So it's important to know what stage of development your business is at, what the options are to you in terms of lab space, and what the future options are, you always need to be looking long term in terms of you might start in a shared lab, work your way through um, the products and labs available within a science park, or you may need to move 
location entirely. So it's always worth keeping that, that in mind. Um, so on this slide, we can see we've got startup companies, SME companies, scale companies, and corporate companies. So when we look at startups, we're thinking about spin off companies, might be their first lab space. When we talk about SMEs, we're talking about companies which have they've grown, they've incubated, they've got maybe four to 10 employees and they're starting to run a little bit more complexity in the activities they're performing and from uh, their lab to be able to handle. And then we're looking at scale-up companies where they're starting to emerge over 10, maybe 20, 30 employees, starting to get to be fairly sizable companies at this point. And then corporate companies is the dream. We all hope to reach that point where We've got multiple locations, we've got big budgets, and we're designing our own labs. Um, so when we're looking at lab spaces, um, this slide probably a little bit out of order, not only to notice that, but we'll move on anyway. Um, so we, when we're talking about that containment and contamination, we need to be looking at what does it mean at the different levels of containment? So you'll find in the industry, Different countries and different areas have different nomenclature for this. In the UK, the legislation is containment levels. This is similar to biosafety levels in the US. Um, it's used interchangeably through a lot of that. But understanding where, where your activities fit will really inform what, um, what you need from your lab space. So containment level one is usually non-harmful substances, bacteria, fungi, parasites. Things like this can also be genetically modified. Um, and there's specific regulations around this. Um, you can find information on the HSE website around specific categories of organisms and where they fall. Containment level one is very easy to find. Um, the, the actual requirements are quite small in terms of you need ventilation, you need vinyl floors, you need sinks and uh, lab benches to work on. Containment level two is where we start to get uh, hazardous materials. Uh, and these can contain uh, pathogens, um, organisms that can cause ha hazards and uh, harm to humans. So again, the, the best place to go and find information about this is on the HSE website, um, which uh, we have a link to in the, at the bottom of this slide. Uh, containment level three becomes quite intense. This is where we've got uh, specifically hazardous uh, uh, materials, and there's a lot of uh, controls that are required for that. So if you you risk assess your activities and find you're working in containment level three, I would recommend speaking to a health and safety consultant and working with specialist companies to build that facility. Right, I'm going to move on to the next slide. A lot of companies are going to be looking for lab space in the early stages when they're starting up. And your, your mind will automatically go, I want a big lab with lots of equipment. And this is not necessarily un, uh, affordable in the early stages. So shared labs are an ideal place for startups to start. They're typically found within universities or science park incubators. And they have lots of benefits from keeping the cost down to a minimum, sharing that cost across, across multiple occupants whilst accessing the equipment and the environment that you need to work in and be part of an ecosystem. Obviously, there are challenges with shared labs, and they include the activities which you're able to safely undertake can be restricted. And sometimes there's communication issues between multiple companies working in space. Uh, but these can be a really powerful area for you to, to work in. I typically have access to high-end uh, lab equipment through partnerships through um, pay-as-you-go services. You have a fixed monthly cost and you've got all of those logistics and hazard um, pathways already mapped out. So this is a really great idea for startup companies. Then as you start to grow, where, where do you go next? We're starting to see a trend of these service laboratory or incubator labs starting to appear. So these are modular spaces, typically for 100 to 400 square foot, suitable for, we tend to say 100 square foot per person, so um, as a minimum. So, so if you've got one to two employees, up to three or four employees, you can find modular 
lab space on Science Park for university incubators, where you have dedicated space and you're able to do more complex hazardous tasks because you've got control over your space. But you also have access to communal equipment, shared um, breakouts. So you've still got the benefits of the ecosystem and the networking opportunities that that uh, brings. Obviously, the downside to this is they're usually quite small. Uh, they're more expensive than shared labs. And the lease terms are not as flexible. So shared labs are usually month to month growing contracts. Uh, whereas you start to get into the actual 12 to 24 month lease world with these type of products. Uh, the next one would be the, where you're starting to scale up, you're starting to look for larger lab space. This is probably what you would typically expect when you your mind wanders to lab spaces. Um, these exist up and down the country. Uh, a pro and a con is they, they're already fitted out, they already exist, they've got lab benches, they've got uh, a ventilation, uh, and they're, they're usually larger than service labs. And you can do a lot of uh, more hazardous work in these environments. Um, the problem with these labs is they are designed either by the owner of the science park, the university, or the previous customer. So there's usually a compromise involved in this, and that's either your budget restraints don't allow you to get the lab size that you want, the equipment that you want. Um, so it's always worth keeping in mind that the the shared labs and the service labs can allow you to build towards this point. The next stage of growth would be, you've got to that point where you've got larger budgets and you're starting to design your own lab. Um, and this becomes a bit of a, a minefield. You've got a lot of things to consider in this area. Um, so what, what one thing I wanted to bring out of this talk was what are the things you need to be considering when you're designing labs or looking for labs in the, in the entirety. So the main things to be considering is, obviously the first thing you think about, I've got X amount of staff when I need to do X, Y, and Z in the lab. You need to be thinking about this from today, tomorrow, six months, 12 months, or even two years down the line, what does that space need to look like? What different areas do you need to have in that space? Do you need, need chemistry areas? Do you need biology areas, cell culture, clean rooms, radioactive rooms? really have a strong grasp of what the activities you're needing to do in the different areas. Uh, so the main thing I probably would like to pull out on this slide is um, when you're looking at your spaces, regulatory requirements have a major impact on whether your space is suitable for that type of work. In the early stages, one regulation may uh, impact your business. And as you grow that changes, different regulations become applicable and it's really important to have a grasp of what they are so you can plant that space for the future. Um, so I'm just going to bring it up to an end now. So what, what, where can you find these different types of science labs? Um, within the science park you're going to find people who are there who have got an experience in building ecosystems, supporting customers, customers who have been there before experience the, the hurdles and the challenges you're experiencing uh, and hopefully there's the mixture of shared labs through service labs through to lease labs and through to space to design your own labs um, so that's uh, me coming to the end of my talk hopefully, thank you gareth um, in the interest of time, we won't take questions, but you do have some, in, I think, in Q&A. Um, if you would care to just go and have a quick look in there. Um, so over to you, Mike, now from BioCent. We'll start with Mike and then go into Angelo's talk. So perfect, we can see those, Mike. Hello, thanks for the opportunity to speak today, um, Sarah. Just checking everyone can see my slides. Perfect, good, thank you. Um, um, so just some brief introductions to begin with. Um, I'm Mike Piper, I'm Chief Commercial Officer at BioAscent. 
Um, I joined BioAscent in January 2018 um, when I was employee number seven. We're now around 85 people. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with us at BioAscent, we are a small molecule drug discovery CRO, contract research organization. We're based just between Edinburgh and Glasgow on an old big pharmaceutical site, an old organ on site. Um, relevant to some of Graham's talk, so we work predominantly with biotechs of all sizes from the very early seed biotech with perhaps just one or two employees, founders, um, and no lab capabilities themselves, all the way up to really quite large biotechs of perhaps 500 or 1,000 people. Um, importantly, we don't just supply a pair of hands in the labs or many pairs of hands in the labs, we supply um, real expertise too, and I think ourselves and most UK CROs, to be honest, work best as scientific partners. Um, so I'm also joined by my colleague Angelo, who will introduce himself later, and Angelo is going to talk about a real recently published example of how you can collaborate um, with CROs and the benefit you can get from CROs um, at the end of this talk. So why work with a CRO? Um, I think in a nutshell, a CRO gives you flexible access to drug discovery capabilities and expertise, but that bit in brackets is really important. It's got to be the right drug discovery capabilities and expertise. Um, every project is different, but the issues that you face are often similar from previous projects. Um, so it's good to find a CRO that's worked on similar projects, similar programs, solved relevant, relevant problems. Um, and in the end, you work with the CRO so you can rapidly progress your project. Um, Another way of looking at this is that the right CRO will have the right team for your project. And this also alludes to someone that Graham said, um, you know, you, the founder, will be the expert in your program. Um, you'll know the right CRO when you see them. You'll know the right CRO when you see them, when you speak to them, when you speak to their scientists. From the CRO's perspective, what does this mean? It means we're a people business. Um, you know, as a, a biotech company, a biotech company is primarily their asset is, is their intellectual property, the drugs they're developing. In a CRO, it's quite different. Obviously, we have labs and we need to have labs with the right, the right equipment. Um, but in the end, our main asset is our people, our scientists and their expertise and also our reputation. Um, I won't dwell on this slide, um, but this is just thinking about the sorts of skills and expertise your, your project might need to access if you're, if you're working on a small molecule drug discovery project. So you might be starting at right at the start of assay development, you might have some hits, you might already be at hits to lead stage. Ultimately, working with a company like us, you're looking to get to lead optimization and candidate selection, getting a molecule that's ready to go into preclinical talks. Um, and the sorts of capabilities you're going to need are, are biosciences, um, medicinal and computational chemistry, um, DMPK in particular, um, and ideally supporting compound management and logistics as well. Now, this is, this is coming on to the meat of my talk, if you like, this slide. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm on the other side of this process a lot. So, you know, how do you select the right CRO? How do you find and select the right CRO? What are the key things to look out for? Um, the first thing to do, I think, is identify what are what capabilities you need and what gaps you have, both in capabilities and expertise. Um, and a, a side question there is, are you looking for a scientific partner or you're really just looking for a data generator? Do you have all the expertise you need in the house and you're really just looking for a, some pairs of hands to generate data? Because you're probably going to end up talking to quite different CROs, depending on which of those you're looking for. Then identifying potential CRO partners. Now, this, this probably can be harder than it sounds because there's a lot of CROs out there. It's a very competitive market as a CRO. Um, so, you know, where would you find the right CRO? Um, I guess there's a number of places you could you could look to begin with. I think Medicines Discovery Catapult would be a, a good place to start. I think um, Sarah and Graham and team know the market really well. You're probably working with expert consultants in some key areas, perhaps chemistry or biology or DMPK. They'll have worked with CROs in the past, probably had good experiences with some, bad with others. Um, recommendations from peers, I think, are very powerful. Um, I always think it's worth just doing a Google search as well. So, for instance, if you're working on GPCR program, you know, stick in GPCR CRO or stick in your target and see what comes up. Then initial due diligence. So you, you, you find some CROs you think might be right or you get some recommendations. Um, get in touch with them and I'd encourage even at an early stage, speak to them. It doesn't necessarily have to be under CDA initially, but speak to their scientists. Um, and have their scientists across the key disciplines that your project needs, have they worked on similar projects, do they have relevant target class expertise? That's what you're really looking for in that initial stage, I would say. 
Um, another very important question before you go and ask for quotes and get to that stage is are they conflicted in your target? And you are going to need a CDA in place for that. Um, but it's not unknown um, for a CRO to already be working on the same target for another customer, and that will rule them out. Then sourcing and comparing quotes from a shortlist. Um, and it's not just the quote themselves, it's the whole bidding process. It's going to give you a good idea of how interested they really are in working with you. Um, you know, uh, if you're having to drag information kicking and streaming out of them, it's probably not a great sign. Um, you know, also, do you feel that um, you're getting what you need? Are they designing the program that's right for you? Or are they just looking to sell you five pairs of hands in the labs and don't really care too much about your program at this stage? Also not a great sign if that's, if that's the case. But probably most important of all is the, the quality and detail of the sand dev input during that process. And that is going to give you an idea of how interested they are as well. And last but not least, price is important. Then making your decisions. There's a few pitfalls here as well to be aware of, I would say. Um, one of the key things is are the scientists you're speaking to during the, the selection process the ones you'll actually be working with? So we do hear a lot of biotech say, you know, it's funny, we, we were sold to the A team and we worked with the C team um, and that can happen. Um, so, be, you know, that's definitely something to keep an eye on. Are the senior site, you're likely to be speaking to quite senior members of the team during the bidding process. Will they be involved in the project? And if not, who will be? A CRO might not know because you've got to juggle a lot of work as a CRO and you might not know exactly who's going to be on a project, but they should have an idea and they should be able to give you some information. And then I'm always surprised how few customers ask for references. Um, I think there's a lot of value in asking for references, um, particularly if it's customers, other, other customers who've worked on similar type projects, similar target classes, that sort of thing. But in the end, I think our philosophy is, um, is that our customers will know the right CRO when they see them. If we're the right CRO, they'll know when they speak to us. Um, so speak to a few. That's that if I can give one piece of advice, that's it. You know, speak to two or three at least, um, and then make an informed decision. Uh, just quickly, just one one real data slide. This is this is the team of bio was saying. You can see we've got a median of about 15 years experience across the team. That's a decent level of experience. That's a decent level of experience. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass to Angelo um, to, to briefly present a real life example of a, of a biotech working with a CROS um, and the value they got from that. Thanks, Angelo. Thank you, Mike. I'm Angelo Pugliese. I'm the Associate Director of Insilico Discovery here at Bioascent. I have been with Bioascent a little bit more than three years. I started in the middle of the pandemic in, two, in January 2021. Next slides, please, Mike. Thank you very much. This, um, I will speak about a productive collaboration we had with a biotech company in, in Boston called Arcuda Therapeutics. They were interested uh, in a particular ion channel to target a particular ion channel called TRPML1, transient receptor potential mucolipin 1. When this ion channel is mutated or dysfunctional in general, it is, seems to be associated with neurodegeneration. Neurodegeneration means diseases like Alzheimer, ALS, and Parkinson's. And Arcuda was trying to understand the biology better of this particular target, had to find two compounds. Next slide, Mike, please. So what they needed, uh, they needed to obviously discover a novel small molecule uh, TRPML1 agonist. To do that, they need expertise in it finding technologies in biology in developing a particular type of assays, and also access to specialized skills like structure based drug design and computational chemistry if hits were found so they could be developed. So, what we could offer, what they told, what they thought we could offer. Um, we had uh, an, a very experienced team of biologists with high throughput screening capabilities here at Biosent. We have, we have our own um, screening library over around 100,000 compounds IP free. And also we had an in silico team, which I lead and is, um, experience in structure based drug design and to drive uh, small molecule optimization and also uh, a proven track record in drug discovery. Next slide, Mike. So how did the collaboration unfold? So the first step in any 
collaboration between two partners is trying, especially between a CRO and a biotech or pharma company, is trying to understand what the client's goals were and, and, the, biological, and the biological target as well. That's what we did. Um, try to, 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 to assess the drugability of the target and the biological evaluation done by the biologists here by Ascent. Then we run, uh, we develop the assay and we run how to put screening on this particular target. We found a number of hits. And then when we, this hits was found, um, we used computational chemistry to design it better leads, try to improve the binding of and, and quite a few properties of these particular ligands. Next slide, Mike, thank you. Then it was a successful partnership because the, the, the HTS using a flipper assay was run using our, as I say, 100,000 compounds library. And we found one compound that ticks, ticked in many boxes is the compound on bottom left corner here of, of the slides, uh, numbered one here. It was potent, selective and CNS penetrant, selective for this particular ion channel. And then once this compound was found, we use computer aid drug design to, to design better analogs. Actually, this compound 18 here in still at the bottom left of the image on the right of compound one, we constrained the, 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 the structure of compound one and make it more selective, but still more potent, but still keeping selectivity and CNS penetration. Next slide, Mike, please. So what were the advantages, for, the advantages for Arcuda in working with us? They could accelerate their discovery process compared to their in-house capabilities alone. It was cost-effective because they used our team of biologists and our HTS platform and capabilities. They could access the, the, the skills and the, the software, the hardware that our in silico discovery teams has, and therefore all our cutting edge technologies they needed. And doing so, they we were able together to identify promising novel TER PML agonists with potential for therapeutic development. So it was a relatively, um, actually a very uh, successful partnership. Next slides, I think I'm done. If you have any question, me and Mike will be very happy to answer. Thank you very much. Perfect, well, thank you, that was excellent. Um, so yes, we do have some questions um, here to come in for this. So as a CRO, what can the the customer do to make the process run more smoothly? Yeah, um, I think it's it's definitely helpful if there's a a good non-confidential data pack um, for initial discussions and then a good confidential data pack for the later discussions, you know, because I think the, the key part of a, a customer selecting the CRO is the discussion between the scientists and it allows our scientists to better prepare if that's there. Um, so that's really helpful. I, I think the most important thing is to, you know, is to is to take the time if, if you know, once you've got maybe a long list, take the time to to speak to speak to the scientists at the CRO, um, and you know, and see what you think. See if you think they've got the right capabilities and skills. I think it is absolutely something that's best done in a in a conversation, you know, on a video call, um, not entirely by email. And of course, um, another one then here. So in the um, screen that you run, so your cell based screen. Do, do you access the cells or, do, or did the customer in your um, relationship provide the the assay for you to make into a high throughput assay? Yeah, I I can take that one. I don't actually know in the case of the Arcuda one, um, both both do happen. Um, in, in terms of the accessing the cells themselves, obviously you typically need a license to use the cells. Um, sometimes we are responsible for that and sometimes the customer is transferring us the cells, in which case they're responsible for it. Um, and then um, it also varies in terms of the assay development. Sometimes a customer comes to us with a really well-developed assay, you know, a developed to industrial standard, and it's just a case of assay transfer. Other times they're looking at developing one or more assays completely from scratch. You know, there's maybe a there's maybe something in an academic lab which is suitable for low throughput screening, but needs to be uh, miniaturized and industrialized for high throughput screening. And I think any good CRO will be able to do both. Yeah. 
And I've, I've actually got in the, in the Q&A, it, it's not so much a, a question, but a, but a comment, and it's quite a long comment, so I'm not going to read it all out, but there's a lot there, Mike, that you've mentioned, one of which is around the references. And again, they're saying that it's not what things cost, but building a good, strong relationship with your CRO um, and get the references. Why do so few people ask for references, Mike? You know? <laughs> I don't know to be honest. I, I, I'm always surprised how few do. I'm um, certainly well under fifty percent do. Um, in my experience, um, I think probably because some of the people that that get in touch with us have already got a reference, and that's why they've got in touch with us. Um, that's probably a part of it. Um, but I know for a fact there's some people that just find us. Um, and you know we have a really good discussion and they really like us, which is great. But I'm still really surprised when they don't ask for a reference. But more often than not, they don't. Um, as a CRO, it can be tricky to get the right reference because obviously everything we do by definition is highly confidential. Um, so you know, it's uh, some customers are, are are pretty restricted in what they can say. Um, so actually, asking a customer for a reference is, is quite a big thing for us. But still, it's you know it's something we will do. It's something we, we like to do if we can. So. Excellent, thank you. So this brings us to, to the end. I would like to thank our speakers today, four speakers, um, for some excellent presentations and some very insightful um, advice there about at the point you're coming to build your data set. So for next week, we're moving on to building the strategies around your IP. So we're going to be joined by Katrina Carroll, who is from here at Medicines Discovery Catapult, and she will be speaking about identifying the novelty. Um, we're also joined from Garant Lewis, who's Head of Enterprise Services in the TTO at Newcastle University, and he will be speaking about how they tackle defining an IP strategy. And then finally, um, also joined by Anis Naidu, um, who's a patent attorney at Marks and Clark, and he will be talking about building IP well, building your business using your IP strategy. Um, so thanks again to the speakers and I'll see you all next Tuesday um, to progress to the next stage. Thanks a lot, everybody.